Hello, this is recording number two about treaties. And we saw already in the former recording uh, the different phases that are necessary to conclude, to fulfill the formalities that make a treaty a treaty, or in the words of the Vera Convention of the Law of Treaties, that made a written agreement between two or more states or between one state or more states and international organizations or between international organizations a treaty because they are governed by international law. Two main principles govern the adoption of treaties as a corollary of the sovereignty of the states, which are the obligation of behaving in good faith and the freedom of the parties on deciding the content and the form of the treaty. Another preliminary issue before we say a little bit about each one of these phases, and today in this recording we are only going to focus on what I have called there the initial phase, is who can represent the state in this important process of approving new rules that will become binding for that state. So obviously, it might happen that someone like me gets very excited and goes to, um, I don't know, to show up to one of these conferences in climate change and claims to represent the British government or the Spanish. Perhaps my accent will help more with the Spanish one. Um, they might have to check that I am who I say I am but also that I do have the authorization of my state to negotiate a new treaty and to adopt new obligations that others that the state will become bound by. So how do a state check who you are and also how many powers you have? That's what it's called in diplomatic relations full powers, which basically is a formal document that states that your representative of the state and that you have X amount of powers to conclude a treaty. And it, the full power document will specify whether you have only powers to negotiate the treaty, also to adopt the treaty, to authenticate the treaty, or you have other uh, powers. Um, all this is regulated very clearly in the Vienna Convention of the law on the law of treaties. As I have said in the other recording too, it will be good if you can study with the Vienna Convention next to you because it is a very clear treaty, a very concise and short enough treaty that will help you understand this topic very well. Um, so, as you will see in Article 7, that reproduces these uh, general rules that have told you about full powers, sometimes a state or representative of states will not need to show they are who they are because from normal practice they will already know each other. Let's say they are those who are representing the uh, uh, Russia and China and the UK in the Security Council. So these people already know each other. They don't need all the time to show that they have the powers to negotiate things that they already know they can do. In addition, there are some senior officials that um, have implied powers to negotiate and adopt treaties by virtue of who they are. So heads of diplomatic missions and accredited representatives to conferences and international organizations are presumed to have the power to negotiate and to adopt a treaty. So if you are the ambassador of um, Saudi Arabia before the International Conference of Climate Change in Paris, it is presumed that you will have powers, that you do have powers to negotiate and adopt the treaty. You don't need an extra document that says which powers you have. Um, if you are 
the person who is accredited normally before the General Assembly of the United Nations and you are the ambassador or the head of the diplomatic mission of the European Union before the United Nations, again, it will be presumed that you do have powers to negotiate and adopt treaties, but only to negotiate and adopt treaties. Okay? Um, so you will only have powers to do these two things. On the other hand, if you are the head of state, head of government or minister of foreign affairs, the presumption is that, I mean, you're basically the state. You are basically the person who signs full powers for others. So obviously you have the power to do all these other things. Um, so to do everything, to negotiate, to adopt the treaty, to authenticate, to uh, consent, to be bound by the treaty. Finally, we have then negotiations. Um, states are totally free on whether to negotiate or not negotiate. States can decide to who is invited to the table. So some treaties and some agreements will only be for members of a particular international organization. Let's see the organization of the Islamic Conference or the Council of Europe, of NATO. So some negotiations will not be open to all the states. So there's not a right to participate in the negotiations. The states decide who is involved or not. Also, there's no obligation if you don't feel like of coming to the table unless you have obliged yourself by treaty to negotiate. And this is a normal clause in some treaties, for instance, in environmental treaties, you might find clauses that establish the obligation to renegotiate and to seat yourself at the table again in two, three, four, five years. Um, many times when negotiations are about treaties with many members or open to all states of the world, it is necessary or it is easier to carry out these negotiations in an international organization that already exists, particularly the United Nations General Assembly, where all the states of the world are already represented. Otherwise, sometimes states decide to call for a conference on a specific topics. This has been the case for the Law of the Sea, several environmental uh, conferences, the conference by which the um, Rome Statute the, by, uh, in which the International Criminal Court was created. So you can have the negotiations within an organ that already exists, or you can call on a specific conference or a specific event which, with the specific purpose of uh, approving a conference. Um, so that's about negotiations. At some point, states will be happy enough with the text they have agreed and that's what we call adoption they will vote their rules in um, the Vienna convention of the law of treaties about the majorities required but in practice states decide what kind of minorities they will require or not to um, adopt the text of a treaty and once they have um, adopted the treaty they will authenticate the treaty. I have um, there, it's a strange photo, I guess, for international law, but authentication means that states will certify that the text that they have approved in the languages they have designed it is the true copy of the treaty. So I have there a kilo. And how do you know a kilo is a kilo? How do you know the meter that you have measured in your house is correct? Who decides where is the standard? So until very recently, it was mainly kept under um, in an international organization based in France, the International Bureau of Weights and Measures. And you can see there, for instance, apart from a, a meter, and, and the, actually it's also, I find it curious, 
that the uh, treaty that creates this organization is called the Meter Convention. Um, so, for instance, you have there the photograph of <coughs> a kilo that was made, that is made of uh, platinum and iridium, so and protected by different covers to protect it from the environment and to make sure that that kilo remain a kilo. Um, this has been the way of keeping a measurement for many years. This is from 1889 or similar, the end of the 19th century. But now the standard is some complicated physics equation that I don't understand. But the idea is the same idea. When we have copies of the treaty in different languages, translated in different ways, um, adapted to different databases with the owners of the databases, including little mistakes in the database. So if you try to steal their materials, you make money out of it, they can catch you. How do you know what was the original um, text of the treaty? Uh, if you have a dispute with an state, this becomes quite important because the language is important. So states authenticate several texts, which means they sign what they consider to be the authentic version of that treaty. Um, and from that moment, a series of interim obligations start. For instance, when will the treaty enter into force? How, for how many states need to ratify for this to happen? And also the obligation to don't frustrate the object and purpose of the treaty. We will see during class the implications of this and, for instance, how uh, the United States tried to unsign the Rome Statute that creates the International Criminal Court because they didn't want to be bound by this specific uh, obligation. We'll have time to discuss this in class through specific cases. Just want to insist that there is a way of knowing which is the true copy of a treaty, and it is the one that is signed by the representatives of the state. So if I share with you, uh, let me share with you, for instance, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. That's, um, let me share with you now. Uh, here it is, ta da da. Okay, so when you enter on the official side of the United Nations Treaty Series, you will find not only where this treaty has been kept and the true copies have been kept, but actually a copy, the true copy, so you enter here, you will see it has been authenticated. It's a bit long in uh, English, in French, in Chinese, in Russian, and in Spanish. And when you authenticate the treaty, you are also determining the date given to the treaty. So this one was authenticated in 1969, the 23rd of 1969, and that's the um, date we give to that treaty. This is also why it is so important and we insist on good referencing because if you don't reference properly you are also showing that you actually don't know where the true copy of a document is and when you're referencing properly when you're referencing a treaty a multilateral treaty given that number the United Nations Treaty Series you are showing that you know where the true copy of that document is in case there is a problem with interpretation. I will record the third part on consent to be bound by the treaty and deposit. This is all for now.